story of David. From the ruddy boy who was uh, not even deemed worthy enough to line up with the rest of the sons uh, when Samuel was there to figure out who was to be the next king. That ruddy uh, shepherd boy who had such affection for his sheep that he would do anything, uh, and he was so connected to God. Uh, so much so that he was willing to stand up to Goliath. We told the story of, of David and Goliath and, uh, and how he gave full credit to God and full confidence to God in order to stand up uh, to save his people. Uh, then we went through the, the, the trials and the, 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 uh, the fighting with Saul and then uh, the ultimate uh, kingship and restoration of the kingdom. And then a couple weeks ago we had some foreshadowing. We had David now with, uh, with, with countless wives living in a palace uh, with all of this stuff. His life has grown large and he looks out the window and he sees uh, the diminished tabernacle. He sees God living in something that in reference to his life is so small and diminished. Uh, and instead of having that wake-up moment where he says, I need to get back to uh, my dependence on God, I need to get back to my roots, he said, why don't I just build a giant palace for God so I feel better? Um, but God, in God's wisdom, said, you know what, uh, David, you're not the person to do this. Uh, if it, you build this, uh, this temple, uh, it'll be to the glory of David and not to the glory of God. Uh, your military victories, all uh, of, of the status that you have will be uh, put on this temple, and it won't be God's temple, it'll be David's temple. Uh, and in his infinite wisdom, he, he knew that. Uh, so we had some foreshadowing that David has gotten too big for his britches, and he's gotten separated from God. And then last week, the part that we missed, so David no longer feels compelled to go fight on the front lines uh, he's already won his, his victory, so he sends uh, his, his troops ahead, and he's back at the palace, uh, and he's uh, walking around the top of the palace, and he happens to notice a woman uh, bathing, uh, and it, it takes a keen interest in the woman bathing, and um, asks his folks to go and uh, bring her to the palace. She comes to the palace. They have an affair. Uh, it happened to be at a particular uh, Point in, in her cycle where she is uh, with child, uh, she uh, is pregnant, and a scandal is about to break loose. Uh, and David uh, uh, scratches his head and decides, I've got a plan. I'll bring Uriah off, uh, Uriah's Bathsheba's husband, I'll bring him off the battleground, call for him to come back, give him some R&R. &R. Uh, no one will know the difference, and it will be Uriah's child. Uh, so he brings Uriah back, and uh, uh, they have a drink, and he says, Uriah, why don't you just take a couple days with your wife and just enjoy some R&R? &R. And um, he says, I can't. He said, I can't, knowing that my brothers are sleeping on solid ground uh, with their life uh, uh, threatened. I can't go and, and, and sleep in the confines of my house. Uh, I need to stand in solidarity uh, with my brothers. So uh, David gives them some more wine. Uh, and suggests, again, that maybe he should go back uh, and be with his wife for a while. Uh, he declines that, so he ends up uh, having to dig deeper into his uh, catalog of, of, of underhanded plans. And David uh, decides at this point he's actually going to give... Uh, He's actually going to give Uriah his death warrant to take onto the battlefield. So he writes a note uh, to Uriah's commanding officer and says, uh, if you wouldn't mind doing this for me, if you would put Uriah at the very front of the line, uh, and then if you pull all the rest of the soldiers back so that he would be struck down. So Uriah, not knowing uh, what is in the envelope and you know, being uh, of, of, of such good conscience that he wouldn't open the envelope, hands it to his commanding officer uh, and in fact dies. And, uh, Bathsheba, after the uh, appropriate time of grief, uh, after Shiva, uh, takes, uh, or David takes her as his wife. Uh, people don't have Google Calendar yet, uh, so they don't necessarily know the difference between eight months and nine months, and they, it, it's all going to end just fine for David, uh, except for today's story, which I'll get back to. So then what happened in the gospel? Uh, two weeks ago in the gospel, we were building up to that story that is documented in all four gospels, the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, we had uh, Jesus' disciples coming back from their missionary journey, so filled with enthusiasm for all their successes, and they want to tell Jesus all about it. 
And Jesus says, you know what, we need to retreat. We need to go away somewhere by ourselves so that we can uh, really unpack uh, your, your journeys and, and what you've accomplished. And, and, um, and they start and they head across the waters uh, and people see them and they're so hungry and thirsty, uh, not for food, but for something real and tangible that they can grab hold of, something that, uh, something that holds uh, that they run to the other side, and they are on the other side before Jesus even gets there. And instead of saying, you know, sorry, this is our retreat time, we're closed, uh, Jesus ministers to them and starts to fill them up, uh, not with food, but with, uh, with real sustenance, with, uh, with the heart of God. Uh, and, and they are so compelled that they forget about their hunger until, uh, until they don't. And then they realize they're starving uh, and there's no food. And Jesus uh, takes the boy's offering of, of, of bread and, and fishes and feeds the thousands with plenty of leftovers. Uh, and then after that, the disciples leave on the boat. Jesus walks on water. Uh, and then we get to where we are now. Uh, and uh, the sentence uh, right before, the people are kind of perplexed because they realize that the disciples left on the boat. Jesus wasn't on the boat, and somehow Jesus is now on the other side of the water, and they can't figure out how he got there. So I believe that they're not going to catch up with Jesus because they don't believe that he's uh, who he says he is. I think they are just looking for more. This is the guy that gave us all the food we could possibly eat. This is a guy that's done miracles. Uh, let's see what else he can do. So they quickly turn around, they go all the way to the other side, back around, and they run to Jesus again, uh, and, and they challenge him to do more. Show us more. How do we know you're really for real? Come on, give us another great trick. And Jesus starts to say, that's not what it's about. And if you go back and you look at all of the miracle stories in the Gospels, it's seldom about the miracle, which is the beautiful thing is there's always a story behind it or a reason or a revelation about God, about who God is and who God is invested in and how far God's love reaches. Uh, it's seldom about the showiness of the miracle or the miracle itself. And I do believe that as much as uh, God aches for everyone who is suffering and everyone who is hungry, Jesus didn't come to eradicate first century hunger. Jesus came because he knew in 2015, sitting in the pews of St. James would be people who are hungry for meaning and purpose and a sense of God in their lives. And that is what he came to fill us with. So let me step back and go back to the first lesson again that we had today. So David has successfully pulled off his plot. He has Bathsheba as his wife, who is with child, and all worked out beautifully, and he's in his palace. Uh, and then Nathan comes and tells him a story. It's a story that probably pulls a little bit on David's deep roots as a shepherd who cared so passionately for his sheep. It's a story of a man who uh, had one ewe, one ewe, and he loved this pet. Uh, he, he depended on it for milk and, 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 and for cheese and for sustenance. Uh, he, uh, he took care of it absolutely tirelessly. This was like a daughter to him. This was like a member of his family, and he depended on it. And this rich man who had all of the flocks he could possibly imagine uh, has a guest come over. And he's sitting here looking at his flocks and he says, well, I don't want to spare one of these. I'm just going to take that guy's you and then we'll have dinner and I won't have to use any of my flock. And David going back to his roots as a shepherd, is so indignant. He posts on Facebook that this person should meet the worst end that could possibly be met, that he should have to lose his life, that it should be fourfold, whatever the punishment should be, and he is so indignant. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? I started to think about this, and I realized how much anger is out there. How many people are angry about this or in response angry about that? How many people are casting stones right and left, heartbroken and, and, and angry beyond all measure about the, uh, the, the, the death of a, a, of a lion and those that are angry because the, the death of a lion seems to supersede other evils that are going on in the world, angry about a flag, angry about, uh, about the violence in the world, angry about this, politic, this, or this politician, and we're throwing, and we're throwing, and it's so beautiful to see Nathan say, you know what, David? I don't disagree with your response to the, your post, your Facebook post. I don't disagree. You're right. That's horrible. But you're the man. You're the one who did it. 
Look inward. And I think Jesus wants all of us to realize that we got to stop throwing stones, that we got to start building up something together, that when we come to the table to feast on the living bread, that it might bind us together and that we might pour our lives out in love and care for one another, that we might move past the things of this earth to what really fills us up. So what does God want for us? What does God want for the world? We look no farther than that, that last lesson or that, that epistle reading uh, where Paul reminds us that we are called to live a life worthy of the calling to which we've been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and there is one spirit. Speaking the truth in love, because we are called to speak the truth. We must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. From whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. Jesus knew what we needed. He knew thousands of years before we were ever born what we needed. We needed the bread that binds us together. We needed something that would build us up and not tear us down. And when we come forward, every week we have a chance to receive God's goodness and God's sustenance. And we have the opportunity to recalibrate our lives towards unity and towards love. So I invite us participate, to receive the bread of life, and to allow it to change our hearts. Amen.